And look, if you're looking for a place where you can ask questions and um, hopefully you can be real, um, I hope that the story can, can be that for you. You know, Sunday mornings are a little bit of a production. You got to find your parking and there's lighting and there's, you know, um, technology. And I'm up here in a tie, which isn't my normal, like, get up. And <laughs> so it can feel a little bit like a facade. And, and as much as possible, we want to try and tear that away this morning as we dig into the teaching and really get to the heart of the matter because um, that's why you really came here. That's why I came here, is to get to the heart of it and figure out something about our purpose here and about God and his nature and who he is and who we're supposed to be. And so that's really what we're about this morning, and that's really what this series of teachings that we're in right now called Chasing Hope is about as well. It's about how ordinary people make extraordinary disciples and what we're really looking at is um, uh, the, the people are the people who followed Jesus around. Because my concern is, we all know he had like 12 disciples and a bunch of other followers, but I don't think we really know who these people were. And we, we think that that information just isn't out there. But some of it is. And so they don't have to be these faceless caricatures that we imagine following Jesus around like sheep following a shepherd. You know, we know some things by virtue of um, history, archaeology, for example. Um, theology. We know, like, it's not, it wouldn't have been normal for a rabbi to call followers. Like, most rabbis would have just welcomed followers, but to go out and, and call them. Only the radical rabbis did that. We know also that the people who followed Jesus were not this monolithic block that we n- normally think of. Again, we create the caricature because we lack details, But we have some details of these people's lives. You have to look for them. They're like finding Easter eggs in the movies. You know, it's like one of my favorite things to do in the Bible is to find these little Easter eggs, these little surprises. I find them all the time still. As a pastor who's been reading the Bible in some form or fashion my whole life, I still keep finding new little details. I'll share a couple of them today. Just We can flesh some of these people out. um, And and give up on the caricatures. You know, we often think that all of Jesus' followers were poor. I've heard people say that Jesus and his followers were homeless. Um, I've heard people say that his disciples were um, illiterate and uneducated. And that's just not the case. The evidence does not bear that out. Some may have been, but some were very highly educated. Some were moneyed men. Right, And so he also had women following him. And oftentimes we caricature the women. Like they were all prostitutes or they were all um, poor widows or what have you. And he had some of that going on in his following. But some of the women who followed him were just regular old like soccer moms and family women. You know, like they, they were funding his ministry. And so when you dig into these details, the reason it's important, I think, is because when you put flesh on the bone and and realize these were real people living real lives, leaving something real behind to follow Jesus, you can then find yourself in that story, right? And you realize that to be a disciple of Jesus, it means something. It's not just words you say at church. And so what does it mean to follow Jesus as a real person with a real vested interest um, in, in your everyday life, you know, in your job and your family and things like that? And so um, I love um, combing over the lives of the people who follow Jesus, finding details and figuring out who they were before and after they made that decision. So today we're going to be talking about um, James and John, two brothers called the sons of Zebedee, who um, were in Jesus's sort of inner circle. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But when you peel back the layers of their lives, you start to see that these were not poor, homeless, uneducated guys. To the contrary, These guys um, came from what we, in secular terms, call privilege. They came from a lot of advantage. They came from wealth, all right? And so we see that in their lives. Before I get more into that, I want to talk about privilege for a sec because it's a word that's bandied about a lot in um, media and, uh, you know, scholarly circles. And I want to make sure we're on the same page instead of me just saying it and y'all hearing one thing and me meaning another. There's two really distinct ways of looking at privilege, and one is the way our society generally looks at privilege, which is as sort of an inequitable or unfair advantage that people have. But the Bible speaks of privilege as well, not so much by the name or the word privilege, but still speaks to the concept. But the Bible, and Jesus in particular, he speaks to this concept of privilege in a much different way than the world does. But I think both concepts of privilege matter and should be listened to. I remember the first time in my life it occurred to me 
the role that this kind of secular privilege had played in my upbringing. I don't think I ever considered myself a privileged person until I went to college, first or second year of of college, and it was in a sociology class. And our sociology professor, it was a small class, we were at a small college, and you know, it was one of those, we all kind of knew each other, and, and she told us to get up out of our seats and go outside the classroom, and she led us out into the commons, the, the grassy area in the middle of the campus. And some of y'all might have seen experiments like this done, where um, you, it's a teaching moment, right? She told us to line up shoulder to shoulder. And then she said, I'm going to say a series of things, and and whenever I say something that applies to your life so far, take a step forward. And so she proceeded to say things like, if your parents are still married to each other, like, take a step forward. She said, if you had a loving male presence at home, take a step forward. If you've never been um, made to feel ashamed or less than because of the color of your skin, take a step forward. If you've never been ashamed of your orientation or gender identity, take a step forward. If you've never been followed around a mall by a security guard for no reason, take a step forward. And that kind of thing um, proceeded until she was done. And you can imagine how that ended up, right? We were a a racially, ethnically diverse group of students. And by the end of it, People like me who look like me and myself, we were all way out in front. And when you look back, um, most of the people who were way out in the back were people who were brown and black skinned people. And um, it wasn't quite that neatly drawn. There were, you know, some differences there, but like generally that's how that looked. And it was a very striking moment for me. Like, I'm, to this day, I'm grateful for that moment, right? So I'm grateful that I had my eyes open to the reality that some of us, listen, even if you're uncomfortable with the word privilege and how it's used, it's an undeniable empirical reality that some of us, by virtue of certain characteristics we have or certain things we were born into, we start with a head start, right? And that kind of inequity of opportunity is an issue that we should always be aware of and always be willing to work on. Right? I think that's very important for us to acknowledge. We're not talking about equity or equality of outcome. That's like communism or something. I'm talking about equality of income. As much as possible, we should hope for that. For all children everywhere to have as close as possible of an equal opportunity experience in life. Like that's, That sounds like a godly vision to me, even if it may not be fully attainable in this life. I'm going to hope for it, pray for it, strive for it. So that was my first sort of reaction, but the longer I dealt with that, the, the more negative of a reaction I had to it, right? So on the one hand, on my walk back to the dorm that day was a sad one. Like, I felt awful. Even though the teacher told us, hey, don't feel awful, I felt awful. <laughs> she said it's not because of any doing or choosing of our own that this disparity happens. It's just the way the world works. But as I looked back on some of the students that I cared about, brown and black students that I really called friends and loved. The idea that my advantage would stand in the way of theirs or my privilege would would lord over theirs somehow, it really uh, made me ashamed. And I felt for the first time what you might call like white guilt or something. It was welling up within me. Then there was this other round of, you know, (laughs) reflection that I had where I was like, wait, the people that I was standing around had much different experiences than me. I'm I'm a tall, white, uh, Christian, what else did she say? Christian, my parents still love each other and still married, and I'm uh, straight and, and, and uh, cisgendered and all this stuff. I'm, I'm all those categories, but I'm still very different from the other white guys I was around in the front of that line. Like, I knew those guys. I had seen their houses. Their houses looked much different than the houses I grew up in. Like, they came from more wealth, I guess, than I did. And so I started to feel out of place within that privileged circle. I was looking for other kinds of, I felt like her questions had been engineered to, to, you know, have an outcome like that. And I wanted more questions. I wanted questions like, uh, if you've never had spam for dinner, take a step forward. Because <laughs> I come from the rural south, y'all, 250 people, Red Lake, Texas, and I was rural poor which doesn't always get counted in the privilege Olympics kind of stuff, right? So I wanted questions like uh, if your mom ever dressed up the spam with pineapple slices to make it look like a delicacy, no, take a step forward. I, I wanted, you know, questions like if you've, if you've never found a live copperhead under your bed, take a step forward. If you've never had a ringworm, take a step forward, you know? You never accidentally ask your third cousin to go steady in fourth grade. That happened. Take a step forward. 
It's not a lot of options in Red Lick, turns out. So I asked her, and she said yes until, <laughs> until we both found out from our relatives that uh, that was a no-go. Uh, it was a shame. I really liked her. Uh, <laughs> And I don't, listen, I, I don't say any of that to make light of the disparity problem, the disparity of opportunity problem that we have in this country. I mean, I, uh, in a way, in an indirect kind of way, I live that because my wife and both my kids are, are people of color. And I, I worry about them encountering issues that I've never had to worry about personally, right? So I, I do understand that issue. But I think it's also fair to say that while you also acknowledge that some of the metrics that we use to measure things like privilege are, are imperfect, right? They can be subjective, they can be a little flawed, and um, they can assume that we are you know, monolithic in our people groups based on race and religion and all that stuff. You can't really tell everything about a person when you know their race, religion, or uh, you know, or orientation, or any of that stuff, right? We're complex, right? Like, we're, we're com complicated creatures. And the same principle is true when you look at the disciples of Jesus. These 12 men who were following Jesus around, yeah, they all were from basically the same place. Yeah, they spoke the same languages. You know, they adhered to the same religion their whole lives. But they were not the same people. They were a diverse bunch of people, even though they may not have looked it. When we look at James and John, for example, I think they're a prime example of how their actual lives come as a surprise to what you might um, expect to find. And so um, when we look at them, uh, I think what we're going to find is um, how th they um, did not fit into our preconceived notions of disciples of Jesus. We're going to start, I'm going to read a series of passages about their lives. They're mostly short passages. And what I want to do is just finish out or round out the portrait the Bible wants to paint of these two guys. And some of you are going to find yourselves in James and John's place. You're going to see what we're aiming for here. Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 is where I'm going to start. All the scriptures are on your study guides you were given on the back, and um, obviously they're in this thing called the Bible as well. If you ever want to bring that to church with you, that'd be great. Um, so Mark chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 says, When Jesus had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. And without delay, he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat, with the hired men and followed him. So I've read this passage probably a hundred times in my life. Never once had it occurred to me that uh, they had hired men. Um, and I think that's an important little three-word phrase at the end of that passage. They, uh, in my mind, I always picture James and John leaving their father Zebedee in the boat like by himself. Just he's standing there sad with the nets. <laughs> and it's just him now. <laughs> But Zebedee wasn't just sort of a scratch out a living kind of a eat what you catch fisherman. He apparently had built a little empire, like he had a little fleet. He had a staff, a paid staff of people working for him. There's another little Easter egg in Luke's gospel. I believe it's in Luke chapter 9, which indicates that Peter and Andrew, two other disciples Jesus called, their father, also a fisherman, may have been working for Zebedee. Like there was like a little empire. Zebedee wasn't just somebody you feel sorry for. He was like a shark, a mogul, a businessman. And so James and John leaving Zebedee there, first of all, it wasn't as sad for Zebedee as we might have imagined. Imagine. But also, they were leaving behind much more than just a subsistence as poor fishermen. They were leaving behind their inheritance to that enterprise, right? They were leaving behind a successful business. So that hits a little closer to home for many of us, right? They, they had a vested interest in this, and that was their future, and they decided to make Jesus the object of their desires instead of um, this you know, future that, that was probably planned out for them. And so we see already they had been raised with a level of privilege and entitlement that the average Galilean would not have known. That's all I'm saying. They were relative to the rest of the population quite wealthy, I would imagine. And, and they grew up that way. The other little tidbit that I think is important and interesting about James and John here that you may not have ever thought about, I, I was kind of caught off guard by this, which is crazy because it's a big deal. James and John probably were first cousins with Jesus because their mother, Salome, who is mentioned several times in the Gospels, um, uh, who showed up at the crucifixion to be with Mary, like um, John's Gospel says that Salome was Mary's sister. 
And so Mary and Salome were sisters, which means Jesus, John, and James didn't just meet in that passage we read. Like, John and James didn't see some random teacher on the, on the shoreline and go, yeah, we should follow that guy. Let's go. And, like, they knew him. They met with him at Sunday dinners or whatever. Like, they hung out with Jesus. And when he called them, that's why they went so quickly because they knew a little bit about him. I just think that's interesting that they shared some of his blood. And that also might have been a little bit, as Jesus' fame grew, that might have been a little something that made him walk a little taller. It's another point of pride and privilege. They had connections that most people did not. People knew these guys by name, all right? So another point of um, pride was their rank among the disciples. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are always listed in the top three. Peter is always first, and that's probably because, I mean, Jesus kind of had a uh, 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 big plans for Peter, but um, he was also older. So Peter was probably the only disciple who wasn't a teenager. But then the next two, always James and John. So check this out, this listing from Mark chapter 3, verses 15 to 20. We got this? There we go. So, man, he's out of here. Uh, <laughs> he can't get out of here fast enough. <laughs> he's had it. All right. He's all y'all spirit animal. That's what y'all are thinking. <laughs> all right. Mark chapter 3, verses 15 to 20. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Again, Peter was a nickname, meaning rock. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. And then there's Andrew, Philip, and, um, and all the rest. Okay? So... That's intentional to be listed that way. These three guys were always the inner circle. They were privy to things that the other nine were not, right? Twelve plus three, no, nine. Okay, there was nine of the other ones. They were not privy to things like when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Pretty big deal. Only Peter, James, and John were in the room with him. When Jesus prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane before they came to arrest him and take him to be crucified, only Peter, James, and John were with him. When Jesus went to the mountaintop to meet Moses and Elijah, the great transfiguration, he only brought Peter, James, and John. And so not only were they a disciple, one of the 12, well, not only did they share blood with Jesus, their first cousins, and not only were they raised with wealth and power, but they were also in the inner circle among the big three, right? And I think Jesus just loved these guys. I think he loved hanging out with these guys. We often forget that Jesus was a man. Men love hanging out with guys they like. And I think that's apparent in the way they hang out together, and especially the ones he really likes, because he gives them all the nicknames. Right? And guys give nicknames to guys they really like or really hate. It can go either way. But in this case, I think it was that he really liked them. So he called Peter the rock. It's pretty awesome. Um, there's uh, an indication in the Gospels that he called James Big James. Because there was another James that he called Little James, <laughs> who was in, uh, among the 12 as well. I feel really bad for Little James. I hope he got a, a different stature in his heavenly body uh, one day. <laughs> so uh, There's Little James, but the son of Zebedee was Big James. And then uh, John, of course, was uh, the beloved disciple. John was the self-coined disciple Jesus loved. That's how he called himself. And I don't know how the other 11 felt about this. I just know that they were all dead by the time he started writing it about himself. <laughs> so John didn't write his gospel until like 80 or 90 AD. All the other disciples were dead. And so he's like, I'm the one he loved. I'm the one he loved. <laughs> he's always talking about himself that way. And, and I think, um, you know, James and John felt that love from Jesus, felt that special place, you know, that, that sort of privileged place coming, uh, giving, giving them from Jesus. And, and it comes out a little bit, if I could be real honest, it comes out a little bit in John's writing about Peter. I think instead of being second and third, they'd like to be first and second because John has a real problem with Peter. He wants to bring Peter down or wrong. <laughs> and this is part of the human side of the Bible that I just love so much. And, and, and this, it's really on display in John's account of the most important event in history, which is what? What, what would I say? The resurrection, right? The most important event in all of history. And John wants to make sure you know something else. John chapter 20, verses 3 to 8. He says, so Peter and the other disciple, that's John, writing about himself, started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. Why is that important? 
That does not add anything to the story other than the fact that John wants you to know he outran Peter. He's faster, right? And he reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in but did not go in. And then slowpoke Simon, Peter came along and behind him, behind him and went straight into the tomb. And finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, if you didn't catch it the first time. Another reminder here, John didn't write this until he was like 80 years old. He just sat on that for years and couldn't let it go. He still had to make a point. Peter was long dead by this point. That's faster than Peter. You know, it's kind of, kind of ego that was entering in. It's a little bit of a humorous example, but these guys were human. And I'm sure they had some of this going on as, as they um, sort of um, bandied and vouched for position in among the 12. All right. So um, the other thing about that Mark 3 passage from a second ago that you probably um, recognized or stood out to you was Jesus' disciples for them as brothers. I mean, Jesus' um, nicknames for them as brothers. He called them the Wanerjis or the sons of what? Thunder. If you've been at the story for, I don't know, two weeks, you know how much I love this. I talk about this all the time. I love that Jesus called his disciples nicknames, and I love that one of the nicknames he called them was the Sons of Thunder. Like, if you're a guy, you know there's something more going on there. It's not just a religious, like, you're the Sons of Thunder now. Like, it's a, it's a joke. It's got to be. It's, I don't know why. Maybe they were, had a snoring problem or a, a gas problem, or, or maybe one time they both had a gas problem at the same time, and Jesus is like, henceforth be known. <laughs> The Thunder Sons. I don't know. But either way, however it happened, I, it makes me love Jesus even more. And it probably fed more into, like if Jesus gives you a nickname, you're special, right? And so it probably fed more into their um, privileged vantage point um, than uh, Jesus probably meant it to. The, the most likely answer to why they were called the Thunder Sons was because of their personalities, though, their fiery personalities, which are on full display in Luke chapter 9. And, and this is a passage where um, Jesus is uh, getting closer to his uh, ultimate fate on earth. And it says, uh, this is verse 51 to 56, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem, sent messengers on ahead, went into a Samaritan village, because Samaria was between him and Jerusalem, and they didn't welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. The Samaritans didn't really like Jerusalem. They thought they were the real Jerusalem. So when the disciples, James and John, the sons of thunder, um, saw that they had mistreated Jesus, they asked, Lord, would you like us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus turned and rebuked them, and uh, he and his disciples just went on to another village. Now, there's a lot of subtext here. You can imagine how heavily and deeply Jesus rolled his eyes when a few people mistreat him, and James and John's reaction is, hey, let's burn all of them. Men, women, kids, whatever. Let's just get it done. Fire from heaven, Lord. We've seen you do greater things. Let's do it. Get her done. And th that kind of thing. And Jesus is like, guys, just relax a little bit. <laughs> relax. I don't think you're getting yet what I've come to do. I don't think you quite understand, guys. Just hang in there. Let's keep going. And so they keep going to Jerusalem. Um, so hope you're getting an idea of who these guys are. Two brothers, wealthy family, connected to the, by blood to Jesus in his most inner circle. That kind of um, privilege is going to get to you eventually, and that's evident in the focus passage for today, which is Mark 10, verses 35 to 41. Let's dig into that here. Mark 10, 35 to 41. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's dripping with a little bit of privilege there. Do whatever we say, Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Okay, so let me just explain. James and John still think Jesus is going to Jerusalem to be a king, like David was king. They still think that's the plan. They still don't quite get it. And they want to sit at the king's right and left hand, which, culturally speaking, was the seat of honor. Both of those seats would really be the seats that the most honorable, deserving, respectful, loyal subjects of the king would sit in, and you'd be famous, just like the king was famous. And so they thought, they assumed that they deserved those places. And Jesus is like, can you drink the cup I'll drink and be baptized? You know, and what that means is, can you take what I'm about to go through? Can you deal with it? 
And then they say, we can't. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I will drink and be baptized with my baptism. But to sit at my right and my left is not for me to grant. So Jesus knew that they would, in fact, suffer for him. Right? He knew what was coming their way. But he said that those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So Jesus is a little vague by who actually gets to sit there. But his basic point is, you guys still don't quite understand what I've come to do. He's saying, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. And what power and privilege look like to me is not what it looks like in the world. And you're still striving for those things instead of really listening to what I'm telling you. I think that's Jesus' point. And uh, this really is where Jesus' definition of privilege diverges from the world's definition of privilege. And this is absolutely crucial for us to understand. Jesus sees things entirely differently than we do. The things the world calls privilege, Jesus calls a curse. And some of the things the world calls a curse, Jesus called blessings. Don't forget the Sermon on the Mount, right? The Beatitudes. You're blessed when everyone says you're not. You're blessed, right? So Jesus doesn't look at someone who's born into a lot of wealth and say, that's what blessing looks like. He never says that's what privilege looks like. In fact, he says some things to the contrary. He actually warns people who are given a lot of wealth. He says those who have much, much will be expected of them. And he doesn't just say God will expect much of them. The implication is everybody in your life will expect much of you if you have much. And I know people like to criticize like the super wealthy or like the trust fund babies. and that, Those kinds of kitschy things people say in the media or online. Listen, I know people who've inherited or been born into or have worked for a lot of wealth. And let me tell you, it is so easy for that kind of thing to become a trap, a stumbling block, a self-made sort of prison that you feel like you can't get out. If you've never walked that path where you feel like no one really can feel sorry for you, you can't really complain about your life, but you're unhappy, you're miserable, you're lonely, and everywhere you go, people want things from you, like the things you think is the greatest blessing, more wealth, more money, like be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask for. Jesus said that's one of the easiest things to stumble over. So Jesus gives us a completely upside down view of privilege. Wealth is not privilege in Jesus' worldview, right? Um, Bloodline, family name, not privilege in Jesus' worldview. Any sort of ethnicity or race is not what privilege looks like in Jesus' worldview, right? Those kinds of things are actually more dangerous than they are beneficial from a heavenly point of view, okay? And so he distinguishes Uh, privilege from his view of privilege from the world's view. And uh, James and John actually end up getting this. James and John, um, James, the big brother, was the first of the 12 to um, to be assassinated, to be martyred for his faith in Acts chapter 10. He was the first of the 12 disciples. And then John was never martyred. He was the only disciple who was not ever martyred. He faced a lot of persecutions. He died on the island of Patmos alone um, in exile. And so John kind of got it too. Both of them spent the rest of their years on earth serving instead of being served. They got it. They heard what Jesus told them in the aftermath of their request. You know, it's funny. I left this out. But what's funny is after they, after they came to Jesus and say, do whatever we ask. And Jesus is like, nah. Then in Matthew 20, they send their mom instead. Mom. Mom. Jesus. Like, you know, whining. And she goes. And she's like, give my boys what they deserve, Jesus. You know, he's like her nephew. So she's like tussling his hair and pinching his cheek. And, uh, and he's like, no, you're still not getting it. And this is how he finishes up this uh, section of his teaching. This is um, from the same chapter of Mark chapter 10. Jesus called them all together and he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers, powerful people among the Gentiles, sort of worldly secular people, they lord the power over them. Their high officers exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, 
but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus completely flips the script on privilege. I remember the second time I became acutely aware of the role that privilege has played in my life. But this time it was the privilege that God affords. It was um, not in college, but it was on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, where I realized that not only was Jesus a real person who really lived and really died, and the people who really knew him, even those related to him, started calling him God. Even though no self-respecting Jewish person would ever call a man God, something happened, maybe a resurrection happened, that caused them to call Jesus God and to worship him. I realized all of that was true, and then I realized also if that's true, then the kind of God he is is exactly the kind of God my heart has longed for. And I realized that even though I had been such a dark-hearted, hard-hearted, unforgiving, unmerciful, disrespectful, negative, pessimistic, anti-religious, anti-Christian person, even though I had dishonored my wife at times, even though I, I had treated people with a lack of respect, or even though I had objectified women, even though I had done all these horrible things, because Jesus is the kind of God that he is, I don't need to cover my tracks in order to come to him. And he still, by miracle of miracles, wants me. And I, a sinner who had led many astray, I was still welcome with him. And I had nothing to make up for, no atonement to do. I, I had nothing to do other than just say thank you. That's when I discovered the privilege Jesus affords. And it's not about what you have in your pockets, in your bank, in your property, or anything else. It's just about him. Privilege, according to Jesus, is never about you. It's always about him. That's the difference. Privilege, this world talks about, always leads you to feel shame. Shame. I remember standing on the, the commons with my class. I felt shame for being for standing where I stood, and the kids way in the back felt shame for standing where they stood. The privilege this world talks about is just an incessant shame game. But the privilege of Jesus Christ is freedom. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned. You don't work for it. You don't have to preach for it. You don't have to go to church for it. It's just atonement by the blood, the innocent blood of Jesus. And it's done. That's the privilege Jesus wanted us to be thinking about. That's the privilege he affords all of us, regardless of any of our circumstances, race, religion, creed, anything else. And I'm speaking to your heart. I know many people here are decided Christians. I may not even be speaking to you, but if I'm speaking to your heart, I pray you'll take the next few minutes seriously. Because you have an opportunity right now to make the most important decision I promise that you'll make in your life. The decision to live in grateful praise of the privilege Jesus affords you by virtue of his forgiveness. The decision to spend your days chasing him and nothing else, turning all your sights toward him and nothing less, and all you need to do is say, okay, I surrender. I receive. And even if you're afraid because you don't know what the next steps are, trust him. Take the first step now, and he'll lead the way. Would you pray with me? Lord, give us courage, especially those of us who've been walking along the borderlands of faith, really pretty unsure of all things religious, uh, untrusting of uh, organized religion and, and uh, religious people in particular, I pray right now you would help us to see that um, Jesus didn't really trust organized religion very much either. And he didn't really come to up the ante on religion. He really came to extend a clear invitation to eternal privilege, the eternal joy of freedom and forgiveness that comes through your grace alone. And 
I pray that someone in this room right now, in their heart of hearts, is saying, yes, okay, I surrender. I receive what you came to give me. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.